You probably don't need me to tell you that the church overall is not doing well in Canada. I don't know, maybe, maybe you're not aware of this. Um, we have pockets that are doing really well. Uh, there's different places where the church seems to be thriving still. And if you go to some larger congregations or smaller active congregations like ours, it's easy to get into the, the mindset that we're okay, we're doing fine. The reality is very different uh, across the landscape in Canada, and we've been seeing this trend for many, many years. And we see that sometimes scandal or sometimes skepticism leads to some bad press. Maybe we've seen that in the last number of years. And a general falling out of favor in society. And so this is the situation we find ourselves in as the church. And I have to be completely honest, some of it's our fault. <laughs> There's been times as a church that we have aligned ourselves with things in society that have been detrimental or harmful to others. And we have to recognize that and even repent of that if we're going to see change. So what does it mean for us to be the church today? In 2021, the census, it seems 2021 seems like a long time ago now for some reason, but 2021, the census, it showed that the proportion of non-religious Canadians has more than doubled in the past 20 years. So that's when you get your census and you have to check off, you know, what's your religious affiliation. More and more, in fact, double the numbers in 20 years have checked off no affiliation, no, no religious commitment, atheist, skeptic, that, that kind of thing. That's what it's saying. So um, back in, in uh, 2001, um, only 16% of people said they were non-religious. But in 2021, 35% of people in Canada are claiming non-religious. So this departure from the church isn't just because we have a larger immigration population that's bringing in different kinds of faiths. That's not at the core of it. In fact, across Canada, generally speaking, people are saying, no, I have no religious affiliation and I don't want to be associated with anything like that. So what does that mean for us? Is there still a place for the church in Canada? And what does it mean for some people in our families, some people that we know in our neighborhoods, and maybe even our own hearts to fall in love with the church again? Now, I want to be really clear. When we talk about the church, and I said this a couple of Sundays ago, we're not talking about the institution of the church or even the structures of the church, right? We are talking about people. That's what it comes down to. Here's a kind of theological definition of the church. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize this. I'll just put it out there. Um, the church is the new covenant people of God who have responded to the inv invitation to follow Jesus and give witness to the resurrection through words and actions in the power of the Spirit. That's the church. It's this new covenant people of God. We have been invited and responded to the call to follow Jesus. And we give witness to the resurrection through our words and actions, all in the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is the people. Remember the illustration a couple weeks ago if you're here? Right? Here's a building. Here's a big tower. Open the doors and see the church. The church is the people. And that's what we have to say. So what am I asking? I'm asking, how do we fall in love with the gathering of people who identify as Christians? That's you and me. How do we love one another? That's what it comes down to. So I want to read a passage today as we've been working through this. And this passage comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 12 to verse 31. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and, and some are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share in the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. 
If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye. It's, I don't know if Paul was laughing when he did this. It's just kind of humorous when you picture it. Would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, are you picturing it? How would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together in such, such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in the unknown language? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. What a great image-rich passage we have as we contemplate what it means to be part of the church and the place of the church, not within our own lives only, but also within society. I think that um, the concept and expectations of the church can often be expressed by a dominant metaphor. This is going to be my challenge to you to think through this today. A dominant image or dominant illustration, dominant metaphor that you have, and you might not know it, but you have this of the church. And it informs your expectations of what should happen at church. And sometimes when we feel offended at church, it's because our dominant metaphor and those expectations have not been met. What am I talking about? Let me give you two illustrations, only two, and we could spend some time talking about this. The first is this. The church is family. Okay? For a lot of you, you're like, yes. That's actually, that's a dominant image I have, a dominant expectation I have of the church. That's probably why I'm at a smaller church and not a larger church. The church is family. And there's a lot of positive things about this metaphor, this idea of the church being family. Because once you're in the family, you feel at home. You can be yourself, right? You have that sense of safety and security and care of belonging to a family, except... At Thanksgiving dinner, when you have the family around the table, sometimes arguments break out, right? <laughs> and so sometimes we love as family and we fight as family. But this is maybe a dominant metaphor image that you have. But it comes with certain expectations. And this is one of the expectations that might be limiting. That is, that if the church is family, we expect that we should know everyone. And that becomes difficult once the church gets past 50, certainly past 75, we can't know everybody. And so that expectation maybe goes unmet. Instead, we need to create a church where everyone is known. That's different. We can't know everybody, but this should be a place where everybody is known by somebody, right? So this is, this is a dominant metaphor. And, and maybe one of the negative aspects of this is that for outsiders and newcomers, sometimes it's hard to break into the family. Because we're telling the inside jokes, right? We have the stories that we remember. And we have to be careful to keep the family table open. 
Lots of extra seats as we gather around the table. So I'm just playing with that a little bit, but do you see what I mean? Uh, there's a metaphor in operation, and for some of us, that's the dominant expectation. Family, family, family. That's what my church is all about. Here's another one, and this might not be very common here. I don't know, but throwing it out there as an as a illustration. Another dominant metaphor would be the church is a fortress, right? Uh, sometimes uh, we see it even in the architecture of the church. There's a church in the Lower Mainland that Christine and I used to go to for some special events. It's a very strong German Baptist church. I tried my German accent there. It didn't quite succeed. Um, so, it, but it was very German, and they took that, that hymn, you know, a mighty fortress is our God, and kind of turned it into a mighty fortress is our church building. And it felt like that. You walk up to it, and it's towering, very few windows. It looked like archers slits in the towers. I'm not kidding. I wonder if they use them. But there's, and, and it's hard to find the entrance. As you get to the entrance, you're half expecting a moat with alligators and a drawbridge or something like that. Like, this is a very intimidating kind of church. But I wonder if part of the operating metaphor is that the church needs to protect itself from the world. We build a fortress. A mighty fortress is our church. And maybe on the positive side, there's a sense in which we feel safe from the influences of the world within our fortress. The downside to that could be many, and one is that we have a defensive attitude against the world around us. We're always kind of defending ourselves. We're always getting into the holy huddle and, 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 and shoring up our defenses against the attacks of the world around us. And I think in churches like that, we can maybe be very hard to change. Okay, there's two illustrations, family and fortress. We could think of others, right? Maybe hospital maybe schoolhouse, maybe mission station, maybe there's lots of things. This is my encouragement to you today is to think through, maybe with a friend or in a small group, what is my dominant metaphor of the church? And what expectations come with that? Because that becomes very important as we try and navigate what it means to be together in this place. Well, thankfully, we don't always have to come up with our own metaphors because the New Testament provides a whole bunch, <laughs> And we've been looking at them. Last week, we looked at the idea of the church is a bride waiting for her groom. That's a beautiful metaphor, right? Beautiful understanding. There's expectations of the groom. The groom is meant to pay the bride price, meant to go and prepare a place, and meant to return for his bride. That's Jesus. And so that's part of the expectation that we have. But there's also expectations for the bride. The bride, the church, you and me, we're meant to remain faithful while we wait. We're meant to be holy, and in that sense, set apart for God's purposes. And we're also meant to be ready. We're meant to be ready with anticipation for the return of Jesus. And I would say, and I said um, last week, that Canada needs the church to be holy, and Canada needs the church to be hopeful. That's part of our calling and part of our contribution to the society around us. Well, today we're going to look at another one. The church is the body, specifically the body of Christ. Now, where does this image come from? Uh, there's lots of different ideas of where Paul picked up this image. I like to think he was watching like sports. And don't, yeah, thank you for not laughing at that. He was. He went to like the Colosseum maybe, I don't know, but he went to gymnasiums for sure. He watched all kinds of running races. Maybe he picked that up, the athletic body. But in reading a little bit more this last couple of weeks, I came to understand that many of the Greek philosophers prior to Paul and even at the time of Paul were using this image to talk about the city-state. So Plato even used this image when he talked about the city-state. The head of state or the council, that was the head of the body. And all the citizens in the city, like Athens, they were all members of that body. And so Plato pointed this out. He says, we do not say, my finger has pain. We say, I have pain. What is felt by one member is felt by the whole. So it's an interesting image that seemed to be circulating within the culture at the time. Paul seems to pick this up and said, aha, that's a great description of what it means to be the church. The church as the body of Christ, where when one hurts, we all hurt. 
We are all part of the whole. So here's another experiment, or a experiment, that you can do as you go home today. When you go home, what I want you to do is take off your shoes, find a solid piece of furniture, and kick it. (laughs) But when you kick it, make sure it only catches your small toe. No, don't do that. I don't, want, I don't want emails flooding my inbox on Monday. I'm in the hospital now because of your sermon. No, don't do that. But you can imagine it. We've all done it, I think. We got a, a, a new bed, uh, I don't know, last year or something like that, mostly because our dog is big. And so that just tells you a whole lot about us. But um, the bed frame is quite nice, but uh, because it's large, it, it has a, a middle thing in the middle. It it just points down, and I don't see it. And the number of times I've walked by and just caught that pinky toe, and it just bends it. I'm surprised I haven't broken it. What happens when you do that? You don't go, oh, my toe hurts. The rest of me is fine. You crumple in agony. Your whole body aches, right? That's what Plato is saying. More importantly, that's what Paul is saying. When one member is hurt, the whole body feels it. That's a wonderful image of the church and what it means to care, what it means to belong to one another, what it means to inhabit this space together. Uh, We feel it together as a body. So just as the human body has many different parts with different functions, which together make up the whole body, so Paul says the church is the exact same. Both the human body and the church has diversity of parts within a unity of the whole, But remember, this unity does not mean uniformity, right? It means diversity. It just means that all these diverse parts are working together. So what does this mean for us, practically speaking? Well, Paul highlights two kinds of diversity that we find in the body, which is the church. And the first one is this, a diversity of humanity. And I think actually this is the overlooked part of the passage because we go to the next kind of diversity, which speaks about spiritual gifts. And we're in such a rush to talk about and argue about and debate spiritual gifts. What does it mean by tongues? And is that other languages? And And we get caught up in that. And we forget this first part of diversity that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Listen to it again. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and some Gentiles, some slaves, and some are free but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share in the same spirit. That's the first kind of diversity that we find in the body, the diversity of humanity. That's what's meant to be the church. We are meant to be a diverse organism that's made up of all kinds of different people. And I'm not sure, because we hear this so often, maybe we read it in the Bible, we don't realize just how radical it was for a community to exist that embraced all kinds of social status, right? And embraced different genders, embraced uh, different um, uh, people that were of different ethnic backgrounds, and they all came together and were considered one in Christ. That's radical. It's incredibly different. And it wasn't easy. It's not saying, oh, this is a beautiful utopia we're living in. No, it was hard because the masters would come and try and get their slaves back, right? Or some of the people would say, hey, you owe me money, and you got to pay up. Or some of the, the, the rich ones would come in flaunting their, their beautiful dresses and hairdos. Not me, but, you know, their hairdos. And they'd come into the church, and they would, they would demand the nicest seats you know, in the building or wherever they were meeting. That was happening, and that's why Paul constantly has to address the issues of this blended community. It's not easy, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful, and that's what we're striving for. And this was consistent with the teachings of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 8, listen to what he says. I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. That's us. If, in case we don't know it, in case we don't realize, we're not the original insiders. <laughs> we are outsiders. We've been brought in. That was the anticipation of Jesus and the gospel. It's consistent in Paul's teaching too in Galatians chapter 3. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
That's amazing. So it's not this kind of mushy, sentimental diversity. No, this is a very strong unity in the Spirit while celebrating the diversity of humanity that we find. Or how about the vision of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. When we see that reflected in the local church, it's just a dress rehearsal for heaven. That's what we're doing. We're practicing for heaven as we begin to see the diversity of humanity coming into the church. So the metaphor of the body anticipates unity among the diversity of humanity. And I believe this. I believe that Canada at this time needs the church to model this kind of unity in diversity. This isn't a mandate of multiculturalism. This is a genuine embracing of our differences in the unifying bond of God's Spirit. How do we inhabit space together with all of our different backgrounds, whether it's ethnic or social or intellectual or different ideas, and we come together and we can find unity? That's a mystery, but we're doing it, and we need to continue to strive for it. Not an artificial unity, but a unity in the Spirit of God where we can say, brother, sister, I disagree with you, but I love you. And I'm here with you. And we're on mission together. Canada and the world needs to see that modeled because of the time that we're living in that is so fractured, so fragmented, so polarized. Can the church stand up and lead the way to show what this means? That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Second kind of diversity, not just the diversity of humanity, but also the diversity of ability. That's what we find in the section that we generally focus on, on all these different gifts. And Paul is famous for these lists of gifts. He gives all kinds, and, and none of them are comprehensive. So don't try and make a list and go, okay, throw a dart, that's mine, or however you want to do it, because they're just giving a sample of all the many gifts that the Spirit has given to the church so that we can function together. So he lists here, apostles, prophets, teachers, gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, gifts of helping, gifts of leadership, gifts of tongues or languages. So all of this is listed here for a purpose. I don't know about you, but I used to do these gift assessments. I was fascinating when I was a teenager, and I think I've mentioned this before. And I used to go one after the other, and, and the, the problem is I would manipulate them. Because there were certain gifts I did not want and certain gifts that I really did. They're very cool gifts. The gift I always looked for was the gift of bass player. It was never there. Bass player is by far the coolest in the band. And I just thought, oh, okay, I knew I'd get something. Where's my bass players? Where's Jay today? So, <laughs> wow, I'm going to hear it tomorrow. Um, in my opinion, the bass player, I love you, brother. I disagree with you, but... In my opinion. So I'd always look for something like that, some cool gift, right? And so we go through these gift assessments, and we have to be careful with them because I'm not sure that's what's meant to happen. A gift is really some ability that God has given you, but also an opportunity, right, to serve with the ability that God has given. So when the people are out there are making coffee, it's not that they have the gift of coffee making, right? They have the gift... Well, now that, I'm going to hear about that too. But they do. They do a great job. Thank you. But the idea is that they have the gift of hospitality. And they found a way to serve with that. And that's what we're being asked to do in all these different gifts. But here's the point that Paul is making. All these different gifts don't all have the same authority or function. And yet, they were all equally important. This is, this is important for us to get. So the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, they had a lot more authority than those were involved in maybe helps and administration. And we have to acknowledge that, that there are some in our congregation who have been given special authority. So just because every member has a vote doesn't mean that every member has equal authority in every situation. There's some of our leaders, especially our elders, trustees, pastors, we have given them specific authority to lead. 
In fact, there's a little plug for the nominations committee. We are looking for more elders and trustees. And if you're a member, uh, pay attention to that and see how it's, how it's done. However, just because some groups have special authority doesn't mean the others are less important. That's Paul's point. Yes, we have apostles, but we also have those who have the gift of helping others. And that is equally important. That's the kind of diversity and the unity that we find in the Spirit. You might be interested to discover that there's over 122 people in this congregation who are actively serving in some capacity within our fellowship. And that might be a surprise to you. Often we hear that 20% of the congregation does 80% of the work. It's simply not true here. I, I won't ask you to do this, but I could ask all kinds of people to stand up. And you'd be surprised because you don't get to see maybe what happens midweek and what people are doing behind the scenes. But I'm so thankful that you're paying attention to the gifts, the abilities that God has given you, and you're using those gifts to serve others. And each and every one of them is equally important within the body. And I believe that Canada needs to see the church model this kind of unity, this kind of diversity, where we use the abilities and the opportunities we've been given, not simply to serve our own interests, but to serve others to serve the whole. That's what we're called to do as the church, and we're called to set an example. And that's what excites me about the church, is that we get to do this together, and in doing so, we set an example to the world around us, and that's a beautiful thing. C.S. Lewis said this, The church is not a human society of people united simply by their natural affinities, but rather the body of Christ, in which all members, however different, must share in the common life, complementing and helping one another precisely by their differences. We bring our differences together so that we might bless one another and be stronger because of it. We live in a polarizing and fractured society, as I said, and everyone seems to have an expert opinion on everything. You ever read the Facebook comments? Don't do it. It's discouraging. So we need the church at this time to set this kind of example, to show that we can have this kind of unity in the Spirit of God, even though we're very diverse. May God give us strength to set this example in Canada today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we are called together to be one body. And that we don't make ourselves one body, but rather by your Spirit, you have baptized us into Jesus. So we're here together. Help us to live out this truth. Help us to find that unity in the Spirit and continue to strive for it and protect it and promote it, even amongst all of our diversities, so that we might be a stronger witness in this community and that the people around us might see what it means to follow after you and be truly human. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.